Welcome to the Spread the Word podcast. If you know us from before, you know we spread the word that contributes to vital interchange and empowerment. So it's very appropriate for me to be sitting here today with one of the people who has certainly contributed in that way in my life, Svegita Liebermeister from Munich, Germany. Welcome. Hello, Kandra. Nice to sit here with you and have a little chat. Yes. <laughs> So, Svagito is an internationally well-known and respected spiritual teacher and therapist with, um, I guess, almost 40 years of experience working with people, mm -hmm. training people like myself in that field to work with people from a place of meditation. He's also an author of three books. And um, yeah, what else? Did you want to add something to that introduction? Well... Maybe important to say that I have been a disciple of Osho since long time and a lot what I teach is actually about meditation. So for me, therapy is a way to get deeper into meditation. So my focus is more on meditation actually than on therapy. Why well, use therapy so you understand more the importance of meditation for your life. Yes, and that's one of the things that I really appreciate about your work is that it uh, is spirituality, but it's practical. So it's something that guides you towards life yeah. and makes you enter life and not turns you away from it and yeah. makes you a bit... Uh, Because the uh, division between ordinary life and spirituality is actually false. Spirituality happens in your ordinary life. That's why you see, for example, Zen masters They cut wood, they prepare vegetables, they cook in the kitchen. So there is no division between your ordinary life and your spiritual life. And often in our mind, we talk about things which are far away and it becomes a little esoteric. So I'm not so interested in that. I'm interested in transforming your ordinary life. So your ordinary life becomes your spiritual life. Because meditation is something that has to be has to accompany in every moment in your life in simple small activities. So that's why in my work we look at very practical questions that have a significance for your life. Otherwise, it becomes too far away from you, and it becomes too philosophical. So. Yes, and you also use active meditations in your work. Yes. Can you say something about that for the people who don't know? Well. Active meditation means a meditation that is connected to your body. Like Osho once said, your growth depends on how you're related to your body. So when we just sit in silence, it may look like we are meditating, but actually we are dreaming, our mind wanders here and there. And when we are actually connected to our body, we are always in the present moment, because when we sense our body, we are in the here and now. The body can only be in the here and now. It cannot be in the past or in the future. Our mind always travels to the past and to the future. And our body is always here and now. So the moment we are in contact with our body, we have to be here and now. So the body is really a key to be in the present moment. So in active meditations, we work with our body, we move our body, we sense our body. And also we release all the tensions and repressed energies that we have been storing also in our body, in the cells of our body, because our body actually uh, remembers everything from our childhood, from all our life. Everything is remembered actually by the body. So if we help our body to release all these things that he gathered, like you empty your garbage bin in a way, so then you are more free to have more space to come into a silence. So it's very important for modern people to go through a cathartic process where they release the tension they have gathered over years and then silence becomes more easy and more natural. Otherwise you sit and you're actually struggling with your mind. So for me, body-oriented meditations is really a very good beginning for people who want to learn about meditation. At some point, it's also okay to, to just sit silently, but the preparation has to happen through the body. Otherwise, 
your body is uncomfortable, you know. So sometimes in uh, meditation where you force yourself or you struggle with your body because your body doesn't want to sit still, it simply means there's too much activation in your body and it's better to rel release that first. Just like after a long run, your body naturally wants to be still. So I like to work in a natural way where things happen to you naturally and you don't have to force yourself to do something. Because meditation should be not something enforced. It should be your joy. Beautiful, yes. And I know you also work with um, trauma healing and somatic experiencing. And there you work with the body in a little bit different way. Yeah, in a way, when you approach yourself, you can, body and mind are basically one. You can approach things from the mind, and if it has to have an effect, it has to always also reach to the level of the body. Then you can approach things from the body, and through the body you reach through the mind. By being working with your body, you gain insights. So these are the two ways of working with yourself. You can start with your body, reach to the mind. You can start with your mind, reach to the body. But they're always together. And sometimes for certain issues, it is necessary to do both. Especially when you have a trauma, you have to work through your body to heal something in your body and then you get an insight. But on the other hand, if you only do that, you may forget your mind pattern. So your mind may bring you again and again in a similar situation. So then the body has to go through the same difficult experience again and again. So you also have to understand your pattern. And your pattern often comes from your family, from past, from the past. So do you understand how your mind operates? It's also essential. So we have to work from both, from both angles in a way. Hmm. So where does love come into the picture? Because I know you say we need awareness and love also working with people. And when people come to a session, they need both. And how, how would you say that comes in? I would say when you become more conscious, love becomes a natural byproduct. So when you become more conscious, you become more loving. And on the other side direction, it's also true. When you become more loving in a true sense, not in the romantic sense, when you become more loving, also consciousness happens to you. So love and awareness, they're like two wings. One is affecting the other. They happen at the same time. At a certain level of awareness, love happens. At a certain depth of love, awareness happens. So that's why in the mystery schools you have these two paths. One, some enlightened people, they they follow the path of love and they reach to, to awareness. Some other enlightened masters, they followed the path of meditation and they reach through love, to love. So one has to feel also what is suitable for you. But basically both happen together. Is that your experience too? Yes. When... Uh, when my awareness grows, I become more relaxed and then something in my heart happens. I become more open to people. When I understand something more about a person, even a person I didn't like before, I start feeling open to that person because I understand now something about this person, this person's life and this person's past. And I find myself loving this person. Even in the beginning, I couldn't love this person because I didn't understand something. And that's how also we work in family constellation. By understanding something about your family, your family members, the people you're close to you, by understanding something about them, you start discovering, you become open and you become loving and you start feeling love towards them, even to people you couldn't love before. So this kind of awareness takes you always beyond judgment. Otherwise, it becomes a struggle. It's more like 
okay, judgment is not good, I shouldn't judge, but as everybody knows, it doesn't work like this. Even you try not to judge, it still stays within you. It becomes an inner struggle. So rather than doing that, we work on our understanding and our awareness and we find judgments disappearing without doing anything. Right. And you just had a beautiful weekend workshop here in Stockholm with family constellation work. And it was a little bit special. We, uh, just as we were going there, uh, you learned that uh, Bert Hellinger, the founder of the method, has uh, passed away, 94 years old. Yes. I know you trained with him personally, so would you like to say something about what he gave you, showed you? Well, many things, of course. First of all, I discovered this method of family constellation through him. But more than that, what I learned, what uh, I found striking, first of all, that even he was so old, he was a person who continued to learn. That means he was not stuck with a concept, that he was always ready to change his opinion about things according to what he discovered. And mm. I found it quite remarkable because normally people who get older, they become a bit more rigid and they got a bit stuck in their old, with their old experience and their old beliefs and they're not ready to continue learning. And this is something I found quite remarkable with him, that he was ready to change direction. And uh, for me, this is also a good example to stay open, to learn, and not to get stuck in what you think about life, but to let yourself be open to new experiences and to find a new understanding, to be always fresh in a way. So it's not a question of age, it's a question of your open openness. And uh, another thing that I liked is that I felt he was not very dogmatic, at least in the beginning. He was not, uh, yeah, let's say, feeling I discovered something, mm -hmm. and but it's more something came to me, doesn't belong to me. And this I also like, because for me, creativity in general means you're open and something comes to you from existence. So you cannot really say, I discovered it. You are only available and then something comes to you and that is what's called creativity or creativity in the true sense. So that's why I liked when he I don't. I haven't been with him in the last years anymore. But in the beginning, that he used to say, "It's not mine. The method is not mine." Hmm. And uh, yeah, this attitude I liked. Beautiful. And the title of this workshop was "Life, Love, and Death." So that was obviously a good way to spend a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it may frighten a few people, <laughs> but um, for me. My beloved wife and partner left the body two and a half years ago, and since then, a lot in my life and my life direction actually has changed. I like to be more looking at what is essential. And of course, love is the most important thing in one's life, and one should be in touch what is really important, because mostly, we spend our, our life doing unimportant things that actually have no meaning. And the whole world is busy and gets so, gets so hot about things which often, when you look at it, are really unimportant. So I like to remind myself and other people as well to look and to come in touch with what is really important in life. And one thing is, of course, to ask yourself, am I really alive? Or am I just vegetating? Am I just living a dead routine in my life? Or am I really alive? And when you are really alive, you are adventurous, you are ready to risk, you are ready to go into the unknown, and you are ready to drop securities. Unless you do that, you are not really alive. So we look into that, what it means to be really alive. 
The other thing about love is that we often call things love which are not love at all. So there's so much talk about love, but very little love, real love actually happens. So we are full of conditioning about love and calling things love which are not love at all. So I like to investigate myself and with people together. Is that really love, what I'm calling love, or is it something else? So to become clear what love really is. This is also something I like to investigate. Yeah, because I think we're a lot of people who have um, first spent maybe years and years chasing love in some way, maybe romantically or trying to get it from somewhere. And then maybe we start on a spiritual path and we hear, no, love is inside you. It's not outside and all this. But it can still be a concept. Yeah, everything is a concept. So whether you have the concept from your parents or you have the concepts from a spiritual teacher doesn't really make any difference. You have to make your own experience. So for me, a workshop is an opportunity for everybody there to make an experience. That's why I said before, we have to look at practicalities. We look at practical things and we create situations also in a workshop where every participant can actually make an actual experience. Only experience is really yours. Every el everything else is just a learning and a concept. And it doesn't really not matter where it comes from. So for me, it is important to put yourself into situations where you can ma make actual experiences. So in a workshop, of course, there's a great opportunity to, to make an experience about love because there are many other people there also. You meet other people and you can see yourself and you see yourself in the mirror of others. So this is a good s situation where you can make actual experiences and an experience about love. And the third thing, uh, just let me finish, yes. is about death because that is also something quite important which uh, in our society we often blend out this subject. Nobody likes to talk about death. And everybody is so much youth-oriented. That's why even young people already start being worried if they have wrinkles or this or that or their tits hang down or I don't know what. So we are wanting to forget really that we are getting older and we are going to die. So our whole society and our whole life is often built around forgetting the fact that our life is very limited and actually when you look at it in the whole eternity our lifespan is just nothing it's maybe like a split second and to realize my god what am i doing and i'm taking myself so important i make so much drama in this short time rather than spending it in a more meaningful way so the awareness of death is a very important to come to the point to what is essential and what you really want to do in life. So it is very important and very good to have an awareness that your life is limited and not trying to postpone that. So for me, life actually, as Osho said, Life is a preparation for death. Bad death is the ultimate peak of life. And when we die, in a way, our body disappears, our mind disappears. So we, in a way you can say we come from nothingness and we go to nothingness. So in between, in being here, what can we be? We are also nothing. And our ego always makes us wanting to be something. And that's why it is false. So the learning in life really is to learn how to be a nothing, how to live your si life as if you are not. And that is contrary to the whole conditioning that we have. The whole conditioning is be something, be someone. And the real life actually is a learning to disappear in your way while you are still in this body. So an enlightened person for me is a person who is really in a deeper sense an absence. 
he is not there as a personality, as an ego. There is nobody. And for me, to learn this is actually the ultimate learning. And I'm very interested in that. So when I do a workshop, I want to focus myself and others in this direction. So that is my interest, really. Yes, because the paradox is when you disappear, that you are really present in a way, that you can really experience things as they are here now. Yeah. Presence means you are not there. Yes. Like that. <laughs> then there is presence. Mm. And there are two ways how to disappear. One is, as I said before, one is meditation. In meditation you go in and in and in and you discover there is only emptiness. There is nobody. There is no I. And the other way to disappear is in love. Because love also gives you a taste of you're not there. If you have a deep experience of love, you find you are gone. And that's why also people are actually afraid of moving deep into love. Because in love you also disappear. And uh, yeah, so this is really my interest. Mm. So I was listening to another interview with you, uh, this uh, Passion Sunday one from mm -hmm. Dubai, which is on YouTube, so you find it there. And in the beginning you say that obviously most of our problems uh, are related to our family and our family history. And I think for a lot of people, maybe especially in Sweden, where family is not so strong in a way, uh, we don't have that sense that we're connected, that our problems are related to our family. It's like we grow up, we move away from home, and then who cares about parents? And it's over. Uh, so can you say something about that for the people who well, don't know? Well, basically, our body comes from our parents. Our body and our mind comes from our parents. We come through our mother. So we get our body and also our mind forms in relation to our parents and to our society. So that is universally like this. So if you want to understand more how your mind and your personality operate, then you have to examine how you relate with your parents and what, what happened in the collective field of your family and also in the lo bigger collective field of your country. You are formed by that whether you like it or not, and whether you know it or not. So not knowing something doesn't mean it doesn't happen like this. So people often think, I take certain decisions in my life because I like to do that. But actually, they're not aware that they think they decided something, but their unconscious decided it. And their unconscious comes from their past and from their family. Even Freud said that. He said it, almost all our decisions are done by our unconscious. The unconscious has all the power. We may think something, but the unconscious mind has no power at all. It always comes from the unconscious. So this is something to examine. So through a family constellation, we it's not just about family. It's just understanding how you're connected to something that you don't even know about. So we are connected to our parents, to our grandparents, to our family, to our whole, to the whole collective field. We come from there and our mind is formed in that context. So this is a way of understanding yourself and then you become more conscious of your own personality. And when you become more conscious of your personality, you become more able to witness it also. Right, because that's an important part of the way you work with Family Constellations. It's not so much about changing something, yes, but more about seeing something. Can yes. you say something about that? Yes, for me, a constellation basically is a mirror. And the wish to change something is actually you rejecting something in yourself or in your parents. So when people come to therapy, they think this is not good or this is I don't like. And I go to a therapy and I'm going to change it and fix it. But uh, inner transformation doesn't happen in this way. Inner transformation happens only through a deep yes and through a deep acceptance. So the moment you want to change something, you must be rejecting something in yourself. 
So we look at that, and that's why the work for me of a real therapist or meditator is not to help somebody to improve, but to help somebody to find a deep yes to how things are, to find a deep yes to yourself as you are, to find a deep yes to your parents as they are, to find a deep yes in what happened in the past. Because you can't change the past. You can't change your mother now. You can't change your father now. You can't change anything that happened in your life. The only thing you can do is to open yourself to it and to how it affected you and how it affected your life. And for me, that is the real work. And that leads to inner transformation. Because in a strange way, the moment you fully say yes to something, suddenly your life changes you. Life changes you. So in a way, it's not you who change yourself. Life is changing you. All important things in life, they happen to you. They are not in your hands. Look, when you look at it at the body level, your breathing is not in your hands, your heartbeat is not in your hands, your digestive system is not in your hand. All the major life functions, they are not in your control. And in other ways, it is also like this. Life is not in our hands. We are in the hands of life. Any moment something can happen and we can't control it. And really the wish to be in control makes you also tense and you still can't succeed. But in the workshop you said out of these three things, life, love and death, love is the only one that is in our hands. How That's is right. that in our hands? Well, what is in your hands is awareness. You can develop your awareness. You can uh, learn to be conscious of yourself. You can learn to be watching yourself. And in that sense, you prepare the ground for love to happen. Of course, you, love is not in your hands. You can't decide, I want to fall in love, and then I fall, you fall in love. Because it's not like this. It's not that when you say to somebody, I love you, or you hug somebody, then you become more loving. It's not like this. But consciousness, awareness, you can develop. And when you prepare the ground, then the more chances are there that love will happen to you spontaneously. So awareness, you can develop. Birth is not in your hands, obviously, because you were born. Death is not in your hands because you don't know when you're going to die. In fact, the Tibetans say, when you're born, the time of your death is already fixed. So even this idea, if I live healthy and prolong my life, is also false. You die when you're supposed to die. So birth and death are not in your hands. But love, in a way, is also not in your hands, but you can prepare the ground where there are more chances that love can come to you. It's like this. If you live with an open hand, there's a chance that a butterfly lands on your hand. You can't make the butterfly land on your hand, but there's more chances than when you make a closed fist. Yeah, that's a beautiful image. And in constellation work, um, we examine these, we talk about uh, the blind love that ch children have, um, which is biological. And then the, the path of growth is the path to a more conscious love. And how would you say that family constellation work um, supports that growth? Well, blind love basically, in a certain way, is not love at all. So a child, really, in a deeper sense, doesn't love his parents. A child has no choice. A child is bonded to his parents. That is done by nature, and it is the intelligence of nature. If that wouldn't happen, a child wouldn't survive. So child and parent, they bond with each other in order, nature does it, in order so a child can survive. So this love is not conscious, it is given by nature. And the love of a child to a parent is more, I need you to survive. So in a deeper sense, it is not love at all. So, but even you can call it love, it is still a blind love. And from that, that is given to everybody. Everybody has that. But 
The other kind of love only few people will experience and that happens when you develop your awareness. When you develop your awareness, you become loving in a different way where you start seeing yourself and you start seeing the other as they are. And that actually is a great learning. For example, a child cannot see and cannot understand his parents. But if you develop, if you grow, and also you're not only growing old, but you're also growing up, then you can start to see your parents as they are, and you can start recognizing them. And that means you have to understand your parents rather than wanting your parents to understand you. And the moment you understand your parents as they are, you feel, will feel love towards them. And that is a love that is not biological, that is a love that comes through your awareness and through your consciousness. And that we can develop. And that's why we do this kind of growth work, to develop this kind of love. And how would you say that's related to creativity? Well, to love someone in a conscious way is a creative act in itself. Because when you become conscious, you give birth to yourself. So there are two kinds of births. One is given to you by your parents, which is biological, which doesn't require consciousness. The second birth is happening the moment you give birth to yourself. You give birth to your own being, and that actually is the greatest creativity in, in itself. And when you give birth to yourself, it also means in your life you discover what is really truly my nature what is my true energy you want to do in life and to discover that is a great path means not only doing something in order to be successful or to make money or to become famous but to do something that is in tune with my inner nature and that is actually, then you become creative. So everybody in its, in, by birth has a natural creativity in himself. He has a special, unique quality. But this unique quality has to be discovered. You don't know in the beginning what it is. So it requires a search, an inner search. What is my unique, special quality? And yeah, so... This is your search through awareness, with meditation, with working on yourself. You discover what is my unique quality. And then you can say existence operates through you. Because everybody has a unique quality because nobody is alike. So that is the creativity of existence. Nobody is repeated. Everybody has a unique quality. And to come in touch with that and to live that, then you're in tune with what really existence wanted you to do. And that is creativity. Then you are creativity. It's not that I am creative, you are the creativity. It's not I become creative. No, you are the creativity. You are the creativity of life. Yes. For me, it feels like uh, the more I do this work on myself and find a uh, yes, I, I sort of disentangle from places that I didn't even know I was hooked. And then there is more room for that river of life and creativity to flow That's through. That's right. That's right. That's why great creators, they cannot say, I did it. Something passed through them, you know. So... I don't remember Mira mentioned that English poet who left many of his poems unfinished because he said, okay, this came through me and then it stopped. So people asked him to complete his poems. He tried a few times, but then he always felt that hasn't have the same quality because now I tried to do it. The rest of the poem is something that came to me and that had this unique quality. And when it stops, it stops. So I found that really beautiful, actually, to leave yourself, like Osho said, creativity means 
you leave yourself in the hands of existence. And I like that. And to learn that, you know, to learn to do something that is in tune with something else, it is wonderful. But of course, we have sometimes glimpses of that only. Mm. So I know now your work has changed since Mira passed and you're actually leading painting workshops also. You're having one this afternoon yeah. in Stockholm. That was also mm. something that happened to me. I have never dreamt about that mm. because my Mira was a great artist and uh, art therapist and she was leading painting courses. And I actually never dreamt I would ever do anything like this. But somehow... I would say life brought me in this direction. And of course, it's my love for Mira also that wants me to do that. Because when I do that, I still feel connected to her. And then I feel I'm learning still something from her by doing that. So I found it very nourishing for me. And it's also the feeling it takes me into a direction where I don't know and it certainly takes me out of my comfort zone and uh, it makes me totally yeah I don't know where this is gonna go and uh, yeah so I don't know where my work or this work wherever it goes I'm just feeling uh, something calls me to do that now I'm going to make also a museum for Mira's art and uh, I want uh, her work to spread and more like continue it and sharing it and uh, this deeply satisfies me. Yes and I can say because I trained with you before and also after and it's quite beautiful how that um, intermingles with your how it really marries the two works and it becomes something else and can you say something about that what do you think what are you learning there what are you finding what are people finding doing this new work to tell you the truth i don't really know <laughs> i don't really know exactly i can't put my finger in what way my work from before and after has changed i just hear people saying that but one um, one thing sorry mm -hmm. i'm interrupting you but one thing that you said yesterday was that therapy deals with the past and creativity is about the future. So it's like you turn. It's like first you, you clear things up behind. I'm talking from a participant point of view. <laughs> and then you you have the strength yeah. to move forward. Yeah. And that then the painting is quite a, a way to enter and discover there. Well, basically, Mira was a very joyful person and she spread and she passed on to people not just a way of being creative and painting but she passed on aliveness to people how to be alive and what it means to be alive and uh, therapy in itself sometimes can make people too serious yes. so this combination and to see people becoming joyful is uh, very important no so only doing therapy work or inner growth work and consciousness work also sometimes can pay, make people very serious. And uh, Mira was such a person to make people alive and dance and forget themselves through being joyful. So, um, yeah, and this is actually a good reminder, no? And of course she... Uh, would say she absorbed or embodied Osho's message of living a life of joy and laughter and like he said I don't want you to be a serious Buddha I want you to be a dancing Buddha mm -hmm. so joy is also something when you disappear in joy you also start disappearing if you uh, have a joyful moment you, ha you have not been there if you're still there, then you're not that joyful. When you're really a moment of joy, you're gone. Like uh, this famous dancer Nijinsky, he said, when I danced and uh, he made his big jumps, he couldn't do when he was there. Mm. He could do it only 
if he was not there. So something took over him. So joy is also like this. If you are fully, deeply joyful, he, something took over and you're not there. And I think that's beautiful. And I feel Mira had this quality. I myself don't have it, I think, so I still have to learn it. <laughs> I would like to say something or hear you speak of um, working with people also more mm -hmm. because I know that's your that's your field. Mm -hmm. That's your um, expertise. Yeah. And I know a lot of therapists who are already psychologists or so. Mm -hmm. They come to train with you mm -hmm. um, because of this, how to be with people and work mm -hmm. with people mm -hmm. from a different place yeah. inside. Working with people is... Uh, a delicate art in the sense that when you work with people there's a tendency your attention goes onto your client and in fact when you look at it most trainings they teach what to do with a client and the more fundamental thing is forgotten and the more fundamental thing is to be in contact with yourself and th this maybe is done by good t therapists or teachers automatically but it's often not being taught and it's often also not mentioned. So people who learn or who work with people, they often have this tendency to be overly focused on the other person. And it is very important to bring this energy back and to be always in touch with yourself. So for me, actually, a good therapist is a person who knows how to be happy himself how to be in touch with himself. Because what you do and how you are in the space you are in, that's actually what you pass on to others. So the method is always secondary, you can say. The method is not the important part. The method is just like a toolbox. But the person, the how to use a method and how to deal, how to handle tools, that is the most important. And for me, that is often forgotten and not being taught. That's why often people are lost in trying to help others. And actually, they forget when I help others, have I helped myself, you know? Did I, did I heal that which I try to heal others? Did I heal that in myself? And this is a much more fun fundamental and important question. Otherwise, it's a little bit like a beer that the blind lead the other blind and both fall into the well. And that's actually very often like this in, in therapy and in psychology. So when they, they made the studies and they found out that in the helping profession, in the psychiatric profession, the psychologists, they have the highest suicide rate of all the professions. And that is funny, and that shouldn't be like this. And these are the helpers. These are the people who want to help others. That's very strange in a way. So when I teach people how to work with people, I help people to come out of this helping mentality. And if you can do that, and you're more with yourself, without having this focus on what to do for somebody else, then a different kind of help becomes possible, which is not so much doing something for somebody else. Then as a therapist, you become much more like a mirror. A mirror doesn't help you. A mirror is just there. You look into it and you see yourself. And if you go away, the mirror doesn't run after you. The mirror has no concern with you. The mirror only mirrors you. So for me, a good therapist actually is much more like a mirror who reflects something of your own mind. And if you are yourself empty, if you are self-present, then you are a good mirror. Because if you don't want anything, if you don't want your session to go anywhere, if you come out of wanting or come out of having an intention for your client, then only you become a good mirror. Then there is no, nothing covering you. So you become just an emptiness. And then the client can see himself. So a therapist has to polish his mirror. And that the way to do that is to deepen your own meditation. 
So I can only think of a therapist who is a meditator also. A person who is not a meditator can't be a therapist, not in my vision. And how much can you do on your own? I'm thinking both on the meditation side, let's start there. Like, um, what if I'm new to this? What if I'm hearing you for the first time? And oh, yes, I want to meditate. Do I need a teacher for that or can I do it on my own? Well, everybody, that's a good thing about meditation. You can do it on your own. For everything else, you need somebody. But, uh, of course, it is helpful, especially in the beginning, to have a little bit feedback and input. So, uh, because our mind is tricky, so we deceive ourselves. So we think we are in meditation and we are not. So it is good also in the beginning when you learn to meditate to have somebody who is reflecting back to you what you're doing but it's not necessary you can also of course also do it by yourself actually meditation is the only thing you can do by yourself that's the beauty of it but sometimes it's good to get also some input and some feedback so relating that's why meditation and relating meeting some people and meditating just like in life also. You learn to be by yourself and you learn to meet people. You don't choose one over the other. The moment you choose, it's a bit suspicious why you prefer. So moving beyond the preference of neither being with others nor being alone. You let both happen in life. You don't have a preference. Then you are open to learn. You learn when you're alone and you learn when you're with others. So in meditation is also like this. You meditate alone and then you join a group or you learn meditation in the context with others and you get feedback, you get input. So your meditation progresses. That's why it's good sometimes to meditate together with others. Sometimes you do it alone and sometimes with others. And when you say everything else you have to do, uh, you can't do alone, what do you mean then? Well, if you want to relate, you need somebody, you know. If you want to to meet somebody, you want to do something, you always need somebody else. Only meditation you can do alone. You can sit anywhere you want, you can close your eyes and you be with yourself. In fact, you're always with yourself. So being with yourself, nothing else is needed. You're already with yourself. You just have to feel it. <laughs> mm. So for everything else in life, other people are needed. Wherever you go, Whenever you want something, you are, in a way, you need other people. But being with yourself, you don't need anybody. And then the practice is to be with yourself, even when being with other people. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's more like remembering yourself while you're with other people. Mm. So then both these kind of things come together. I think we covered a lot. Yes, we talked a lot. Maybe this is <laughs> enough. <huh? laughs> Let me just check for a moment. Oh, yeah, there's one more question I wanted to ask you. I always actually wanted to ask you this. Liebermeister. <laughs> Was it what? How do you translate that to English? Yeah, it's funny. Liebermeister in German, it means beloved master. So, yeah, I don't know. I just happen to have that family name. No? <laughs> Very fitting. <laughs> Very fitting. I think originally it comes from um, craftsmen where somebody was a master and a nice person, so they called him Lieber, beloved master. Originally, I guess it comes from that. Uh, but sometimes it's funny, people who under look at me and say... <laughs> I think it's a very good name for you, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fadito, for coming and for sharing this moment. Yes, it was nice. We were here in the Hotel Clarion, Sign Hotel, I think it's called. So we had this beautiful studio here. I was happy to talk to you here. Thank you. Thank you. And now off to Creativity Workshop. Yes. Okay, there we have it. <laughs>